Welcome to the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast, the latest Swine Health research digested for you. My name is Dr. Clayton Johnson. I'm the host of the podcast, and joining me on this week's episode is Dr. Matt Storos. Dr. Storos is a veterinary pathologist at the University of Minnesota. Matt, thank you very much for coming on the podcast and joining me here. Welcome to the podcast studios. Um, if you would, why don't you give the audience a little introduction? Sure, Clayton. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited to be here. Um, I'm a diagnostic pathologist, diagnostic pathologist at the University of Minnesota Veteran Diag- Diagnostic Lab. I work primarily with food animals um, and and definitely a lot of swine. Matt, as I understand it, you've been working with um, clients of the diagnostic lab to try and help them optimize their approaches towards strep suis management. You want to talk a little bit about, let's just start at the high level, right? Like how many farms have strep suis? How many farms are, 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 de- are infected with that? And how many farms are dealing with that right now? That's a great question, Clayton. So we know strep suis is one of those colonizers of pigs endemic. So virtually every farm is going to have strep suis on its, on its premises. Not every farm is necessarily going to be dealing with strep suis as a farm problem. Um, and at the diagnostic lab, we often get pigs in with various diseases, and sometimes strep suis might be a problem for that particular pig. Maybe we're growing strep suis out of the brain or the joint, and we've got disease associated with that. But when we look at it from the, the larger perspective, when you're the farmer dealing with this, you also want to know, is, is this beyond just a, a, a single pig problem? Is this a herd level problem? So, and that's where we start to get in, um, you know, series of, of a sessions where we'll get cases and, and we start to see two, three, four, five different cases of strep suicide isolated from joints or from the brain. Then we start to say, hey, hey, this is a herd level problem. Maybe maybe you need to start to worry about dealing with this particular bug and, and incorporating it into your health plan. When it comes to raising healthy animals, you need more than the right solutions. You need the right partner who brings decades of industry expertise and a global team to put that knowledge to work for the advancement of your operation. At Fibro Animal Health Corporation, we are proud to work with you as your trusted partner. Very good. So, you know, diagnostically, what are the sort of options you have to evaluate the the strep suicides that you see pop up at the diagnostic lab? So when we think about strep suis characterization or subtyping, there's a few different ways to look at that. Uh, one of the traditional methods is is serotyping, and that's what we would call antigenic characterization. So this is the equivalent of, of the immune system looking at the outside of that bacteria and saying, I know what that is. So it's saying it's a large white SUV if you're a cop looking for a, a particular car, right? Um, then there are other more advanced methods that would give you a little bit more information than just what the outside of the car looks like. So that would lead more into um, genetic characterization or genetic subtyping. And there's there's a variety of ways that we can look at that. Um, some of them are looking at just small parts of the genome. So things like uh, MLST or multi-locus sequence typing looks at six or seven genes that are housekeeping and common across the board. That would give you the idea of of what make and model you might be looking for. So that would be saying, I'm, I'm looking for a white Chevy Suburban potentially. Um, and then there are other things that we can look at, things like putative virulence genes, suelicin or meramidase release protein, that would say these are things that might allow this bug to get a little deeper into the tissues or cause more problems. And so those can be looked for specifically. Um, and that would then give you a little bit more idea of what's going on besides just the make and model of that car or that vehicle. You're starting to get an idea of, you know, is it a four wheel drive? Does it have a, a V8 or a V6? Is it, is it, you, you can even almost get down to what's the gearing in the rear end, right? Um, get you an idea of, of how much you can tow with it. So those would be kind of the ideas of, of ways that you can subtype or characterize the, the, the bacteria at a, at, a, at a lower level. And then there are ways that we can look at the whole bacteria as, as a whole. Whole genome sequencing would be an example of that. Um, and, and there's a few different things that we can do with, with whole genome sequencing that you know, aren't, aren't what we've kind of spoken about so far. Very good. You know, in my career, Matt, I've, I've cultured strep suis from, I feel like, all over the different organ systems of the pig. Um, are there specific organ systems or tissues that should be targeted as part of the diagnostic investigation? Is some better than others? 
That's a great question, Clayton. So the the places that we want to look for Streptococcus suis to decide if it's a problem would be in those systemic sites where we wouldn't expect to find the bug unless it got there, usually via the bloodstream. So if if we're growing Streptococcus suis out of a joint that should be a sterile place, that would indicate that it got there from a different place. Another area that people will target is looking at the brain. Um, we do need to be a bit careful about just taking brain isolates and assuming that because we got it from the brain swab that it's good to go for vaccine production. Um, just because we're often going through the pharynx where strep suis normally lives and you can inoculate that brain area there, but that would be something that I would, I would also look. So, you know, joints, brain, liver is another potential if you have septicemia. And ideally you'd want to combine that with histopathology to make sure that you actually have disease ongoing um, in those areas. So take a little bit of the spinal cord, take a chunk of, of liver and put it in histo, take a little bit of that joint tissue and put it in histo um, and let, let us look at it and decide, do you have arthritis? Do you have meningitis? Do you have hepatitis? Matt, you have a preference is, you know, one better than the other. If I'm the veterinarian and I'm doing a field necropsy and I see those swollen joints, I've got a pig that showed neurologic signs and I think maybe there's strep in the brain stem somewhere. Um, should I send you those tissues still intact and let you take the swabs that will eventually be the culture? Or should I be taking those swabs right away in those pigs and, and, and sending you the swabs? You know what I'm saying? Is one better than the other there? Can I take the swabs sterile in the field? Or are you going to do a better job with that at the lab? So that's that depends on how far away you are, what your logistics are to get the, the organism to us. So if you can get it overnight and you can send us a leg with a swollen joint, that's probably just as good. Um, if you're going to be a day or two, I would definitely recommend grabbing those samples yourself. Um, and if you, if you have the capability, if you want training, you can contact your diagnostic lab. I'm sure I'm willing to help. I'm sure others are willing to help. Here's what you should grab. Um, and so I think it has to do with, you know, are you able to actually get that sample to the lab in time? That's, that's the big part, big part is timeliness. And if you're not able to, if you can get that bug out and put it in a, a, a good environment, you know, put it in a medium that supports its growth and, and transport, and you can get those histo tissues in formalin right away, then I think that's probably your best bet. Very good. A full value relationship starts with understanding your business, and Alanco knows growing the healthiest pig requires focus on every segment of production. Through continuous innovation, trusted solutions, and actionable insights, Elanco is invested in helping you achieve the full value of every decision. Their portfolio offers solutions that manage disease challenges, minimize variation, and mitigate mortality to optimize pig health. Get full value from start to finish with Elanco. Matt, do pigs get infected with multiple strains of strep suis? Do we know much about that? I mean, can I get one out of the joint that's different than the one out of the brain? Or is it typically going to be one isolate that infects a, a pig or a flow? So more than likely, your flows or your farms are going to have multiple serotypes. You're probably going to have multiple serotypes within a pig. Um, each of these different serotypes might have a higher or lower likelihood of causing disease. And so when you're having an outbreak scenario, oftentimes that's a herd that doesn't have any existing immunity. So when you grow that strep suis out of the joint, out of the brain, out of the liver, it's probably going to be the same serotype. If you have a, a stable flow and you've got something else coming in, maybe a PERS or something that's coming in to cause problems, and you're getting strep suis out of maybe a little bit more chronic pigs, you might get a different serotype out of the joint than you do out of the liver or out of the brain. But it depends on the scenario that you're you're within, but I, I, I think it's pretty safe to say that most flows are going to have more than one serotype of strep. Not each of those are going to be equivalent in their likelihood to cause disease. So you, you got to kind of play it by ear, and that's why it's important to try to get multiple isolates to characterize, am I seeing the same serotype one slash two from these different joints in over time? Or am I seeing a serotype one slash two the first time and a serotype seven the second time? And that would say, mm, maybe I shouldn't use those as my vaccine candidate because maybe those are individual pig problems, not a herd level problem. Excellent. Salmonella presents significant challenges to pig health and performance and poses food safety risks to humans. 
as the first and only vaccine offering live attenuated strains of both Salmonella cholera suis and Typhimurium, Enterosol Salmonella TC from Boringer Ingelheim protects pigs against both serotypes with a single oral dose. Talk to your Boringer Ingelheim representative to learn more. Outstanding information, Matt. Um, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing that with the audience. Glad to help help uh, educate and, and provide some tools for, for our producers and our vets. Well, I know our audience appreciates everything you do at the Diagnostic Lab. And, at, you know, thanks for being here on the show. And to the audience, thank you very much for listening to the Swine Health Black Belt podcast. If you haven't checked out our website at swinehealthblackbelt.com, please do so. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss out on our next episode next week. For Dr. Matt Sturos, I'm Dr. Clayton Johnson. Thanks and have a great rest of your week. Hey, everybody. We're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. If you have a swine health related research trial and would like to come on the show and talk about it, share it with us, please feel free to email the research to hello at wisenetics.com. That's H E L L O at W I S E N E T I X dot com.